Chapter Twenty One. Little Emily. There was a servant in that house, a man who, I understood, was usually with Steerforth, and had come into his service at the university, who was in appearance a pattern of respectability. I believe there never existed in his station a more respectable-looking man. He was taciturn, soft-footed, very quiet in his manner, deferential, observant, always at hand when wanted, and never near when not wanted, but his great claim to consideration was his respectability. He had not a pliant face, he had rather a stiff neck, rather a tight smooth head, with short hair clinging to it at the sides, a soft way of speaking, with a peculiar habit of whispering the letter S so distinctly that he seemed to use it oftener than any other man. But every peculiarity that he had he made respectable. If his nose had been upside down he would have made that respectable. He surrounded himself with an atmosphere of respectability and walked secure in it. It would have been next to impossible to suspect him of anything wrong, he was so thoroughly respectable. Nobody could have thought of putting him in a livery, he was so highly respectable. To have imposed any derogatory work upon him would have been to inflict a wanton insult on the feelings of a most respectable man. And of this, I noticed, the women servants in the household were so intuitively conscious that they always did such work themselves, and generally while he read the paper by the pantry fire. Such a self-contained man I never saw, but in that quality, as in every other he possessed, he only seemed to be the more respectable. Even the fact that no one knew his Christian name seemed to form part of his respectability. Nothing could be objected against his surname, Littimer, by which he was known. Peter might have been hanged or Tom transported, but Littimer was perfectly respectable. It was occasioned, I suppose, by the reverend nature of respectability in the abstract, but I felt particularly young in this man's presence. How old he was himself I could not guess, and that again went to his credit on the same score, for in the calmness of respectability he might have numbered fifty years as well as thirty. Littimer was in my room in the morning before I was up to bring me that reproachful shaving water and to put out my clothes. When I undrew the curtains and looked out of bed, I saw him in an equable temperature of respectability, unaffected by the east wind of January, and not even breathing frostily, standing my boots right and left in the first dancing position, and blowing specks of dust off my coat as he laid it down like a baby. I gave him good morning, and asked him what o'clock it was. He took out of his pocket the most respectable hunting watch I ever saw, and, preventing the spring with his thumb from opening far, looked in at the face as if he were consulting an oracular oyster, and shut it up again, and said, if I please, it was half-past eight. Uh, Mr. Steerforth will be glad to hear how you have rested, sir. Uh, thank you, I said. Very well indeed. Is Mr. Steerforth quite well? Uh, thank you, sir. Mr. Steerforth is tolerably well another of his characteristics no use of superlatives a cool calm medium always is there anything more i can have the honour of doing for you sir the warning bell will ring at nine the family take breakfast at half past nine uh, nothing i thank you i thank you sir if you please and with that and with a little inclination of his head when he passed the bedside as an apology for correcting me he went out shutting the door as delicately as if i had just fallen into a sweet sleep on which my life depended every morning we held exactly this conversation never any more and never any less and yet invariably however far i might have been lifted out of myself overnight and advanced towards maturer years by steerforth's companionship or mrs steerforth's confidence or miss dartle's conversation in the presence of this most respectable man i became as our smaller poets sing a boy again he got horses for us, and Steerforth, who knew everything, gave me lessons in riding. He provided foils for us, and Steerforth gave me lessons in fencing, gloves, and I began, of the same master, to improve in boxing. It gave me no manner of concern that Steerforth should find me a novice in these sciences, but I never could bear to show my want of skill before the respectable Littimer. I had no reason to believe that Littimer understood such arts himself. He never led me to suppose anything of the kind by so much as the vibration of one of his respectable eyelashes. Yet whensoever he was by while we were practising, I felt myself the greenest and most inexperienced of mortals. I am particular about this man because he made a particular effect on me at that time, and because of what took place thereafter. 
the week passed away in a most delightful manner it passed rapidly as may be supposed to one entranced as i was and yet it gave me so many occasions for knowing steerforth better and admiring him more in a thousand respects that at its close i seemed to have been with him for a much longer time a dashing way he had of treating me like a plaything was more agreeable to me than any behaviour he could have adopted it reminded me of our old acquaintance it seemed the natural sequel of it it showed me that he was unchanged it relieved me of any uneasiness i might have felt in comparing my merits with his and measuring my claims upon his friendship by any equal standard above all it was a familiar unrestrained affectionate demeanour that he used towards no one else as he had treated me at school differently from all the rest i joyfully believed that he treated me in life unlike any other friend he had i believed that i was nearer to his heart than any other friend and my own heart warmed with attachment to him he made up his mind to go with me into the country and the day arrived for our departure he had been doubtful at first whether to take littimer or not but decided to leave him at home the respectable creature satisfied with his lot whatever it was arranged our portmanteau on the little carriage that was to take us into london as if they were intended to defy the shocks of ages and received my modestly proffered donation with perfect tranquillity we bid adieu to mrs steerforth and miss dartle with many thanks on my part and much kindness on the devoted mothers the last thing i saw was littimer's unruffled eye fraught as i fancied with the silent conviction that I was very young indeed. What I felt in returning so auspiciously to the old familiar places I shall not endeavour to describe. We went down by the mail. I was so concerned, I recollect, even for the honour of Yarmouth, that when Steerforth said, as we drove through its dark streets to the inn, that as well as he could make out, it was a good, queer, out-of-the-way kind of a hole, I was highly pleased. We went to bed on our arrival, I observed a pair of dirty shoes and gaiters in connection with my old friend the dolphin as we passed that door, and breakfasted late in the morning. Steerforth, who was in great spirits, had been strolling about on the beach before I was up, and had made acquaintance, he said, with half the boatmen in the place. Moreover, he had seen in the distance what he was sure must be the identical house of Mr. Peggotty, with smoke coming out of the chimney, and had had a great mind, he told me, to walk in and swear he was myself grown out of knowledge. "'When do you propose to introduce me there, Daisy?' he said. "'I am at your disposal. Make your own arrangements.' why i was thinking that this evening would be a good time steerforth when they are all sitting round the fire i should like you to see it when it's snug it's such a curious place so be it returned steerforth this evening i shall not give them any notice that we are here you know said i delighted we must take them by surprise oh of course it's no fun said steerforth unless we take them by surprise let us see the natives in their aboriginal condition though they are that sort of people you mentioned i returned Ah, what you recollect my skirmishes with rosa do you he exclaimed with a quick look confound the girl i am half afraid of her she's like a goblin to me but never mind now what are you going to do you are going to see your nurse i suppose why yes i said i must see peggotty first of all well replied steerforth looking at his watch suppose i deliver you up to be cried over for a couple of hours is that long enough i answered laughing that i thought we might get through it in that time but that he must also come, for he would find that his renown had preceded him, and that he was almost as great a personage as I was. "'I'll come anywhere you like,' said Steerforth, "'or do anything you like. Tell me where to come to, and in two hours I'll produce myself in any state you please, sentimental or comical.' I gave him minute directions for finding the residence of Mr. Barkis, carrier to Blunderstone and elsewhere, and, on this understanding, went out alone. There was a sharp bracing air, the ground was dry, the sea was crisp and clear, the sun was the fusing abundance of light, if not much warmth, and everything was fresh and lively. I was so fresh and lively myself in the pleasure of being there, that I could have stopped the people in the streets and shaken hands with them. The streets looked small, of course, the streets that we have only seen as children always do, I believe, when we go back to them, but I had forgotten nothing in them, and found nothing changed, until I came to Mr. Omer's shop. Omer and Yoram was now written up, where Omer used to be, but the inscription Draper, Taylor, Haberdasher, Funeral Furniture, and etc., remained as it was. 
my footsteps seemed to tend so naturally to the shop door after i read these words from over the way that i went across the road and looked in there was a pretty woman at the back of the shop dancing a little child in her arms while another little fellow clung to her apron i had no difficulty in recognising either minnie or minnie's children the glass door of the parlour was not open but in the workshop across the yard i could faintly hear the old tune playing as if it had never left off is mr omer at home i said entering i should like to see him for a moment if he is oh yes sir he is at home said minnie the weather don't suit his asthma out of doors joe call your grandfather the little fellow who was holding her apron gave such a lusty shout that the sound of it made him bashful and he buried his face in her skirts to her great admiration i heard a heavy puffing and blowing coming towards us and soon mr omer shorter winded than of yore but not much older looking stood before me servant sir said mr omer what can i do for you sir you can shake hands with me mr omer if you please i said putting out my own you were very good-natured to me once when i'm afraid i didn't show that i thought so was i though returned the old man i'm glad to hear it uh, but i don't remember when are you sure it was me quite i think my memory has got as short as my breath said mr omer looking at me and shaking his head uh, for i don't remember you uh, don't you remember your coming to the coach to meet me and my having breakfast here and our riding out to blunderstone together you and i and mrs yoram and mr yoram too who wasn't her husband then oh, my lord bless my soul exclaimed mr omer after being thrown by this surprise into a fit of coughing <laughs> you, you don't say so minnie my dear you recollect dear me yes the party was a lady i think my mother i rejoined to be sure said mr omer touching my waistcoat with his forefinger and there was a little child too there was two parties the little party was laid along with the other party over at blunderstone it was of course dear me and how have you been since very well i thanked him as i hoped he had been too oh nothing to grumble at you know said mr omer i find my breath gets short but it seldom gets longer as a man gets older i take it as it comes and make the most of it that's the best way ain't it mr omer coughed again in consequence of laughing and was assisted out of his fit by his daughter who now stood close beside us dancing her smallest child on the counter dear me said mr omer yes to be sure two parties why in that very ride if you'll believe me the day was named for minnie to marry yoram do name it sir says yoram yes do father says minnie and now he's come into the business and look here the youngest Minnie laughed and stroked her banded hair upon her temples, as her father put one of his fat fingers into the hand of the child she was dancing on the counter. Two parties, of course,' said Mr. Omer, nodding his head retrospectively. "'Exactly so. And Yoram's at work at this minute, on a grey one with silver nails, not this measurement. The measurement of the dancing child upon the counter, by a good two inches. Will you take something?' i thanked him but declined let me see said mr omer barkis is the carrier's wife peggotty's the boatman's sister she had something to do with your family she was in service there sure my answering in the affirmative gave him great satisfaction i believe my breath will get long next my memory's getting so much so said mr omer well sir we've got a young relation of hers here under articles to us that has as elegant a taste in the dressmaking business uh, but i assure you i don't believe there's a duchess in england can touch her uh, not little emily said i involuntarily emily's her name said mr omer and she's little too uh, but if you'll believe me she has such a face of her own that half the women in this town are mad against her nonsense father cried minnie my dear said mr omer i don't say it's the case with you winking at me uh, but i say that half the women in yarmouth uh, in a five-mile round are mad against that girl then she should have kept to her own station in life father said minnie and not have given them any hold to talk about her and then they couldn't have done it 
couldn't have done it my dear retorted mr omer it couldn't have done it that's your knowledge of life what is there that any woman couldn't do that she shouldn't do especially on the subject of another woman's good looks i really thought it was all over for mr omer after he had uttered this libelous pleasantry he coughed to that extent and his breath eluded all his attempts to recover it with that obstinacy that i fully expected to see his head go down behind the counter and his little black breeches with the rusty little bunches of ribbons at the knees come quivering up in a last ineffectual struggle at length however he got better though he still panted hard and was so exhausted that he was obliged to sit on the stool of the shop desk you see he said wiping his head and breathing with difficulty she hasn't taken much to any companions here she hasn't taken kindly to any particular acquaintances and friends not to mention sweethearts in consequence an ill-natured story got about that emily wanted to be a lady now my opinion is that it came into circulation principally on account of her sometimes saying at the school that if she was a lady she would like to do so and so for her uncle don't you see and buy him such and such fine things i assure you mr omer she has said so to me i returned eagerly when we were both children mr omer nodded his head and rubbed his chin just so then out of a very little she could dress herself you see better than most others out of a deal and that made things unpleasant uh, moreover she was rather what might be called wayward i'll go so far as to say what i should call wayward myself said mr omer I didn't know her own mind quite a little spoiled and couldn't at first exactly bind herself down no more than that was ever said against her minnie no father said mrs yoram that's the worst i believe so when she got a situation said mr omer to keep a fractious old lady company they didn't very well agree and she didn't stop at last she came here apprenticed for three years nearly two of them are over and she has been as good a girl as ever was worth any six minnie is she worth any six now yes father replied minnie never say i detracted from her very good said mr omer that's right and so young gentleman he added after a few moments further rubbing of his chin that you may not consider me long-winded as well as short breathed i believe that's all about it as they had spoken in a subdued tone while speaking of emily i had no doubt that she was near on my asking now if that were not so mr omer nodded yes and nodded towards the door of the parlour my hurried inquiry if i might peep in was answered with a free permission and looking through the glass i saw her sitting at her work i saw her a most beautiful little creature with the cloudless blue eyes that had looked into my childish heart turned laughingly upon another child of minnie's who was playing near her with enough of wilfulness in her bright face to justify what i had heard and much of the old capricious coyness lurking in it but with nothing in her pretty looks i am sure but what was meant for goodness and for happiness and what was on a good and happy course the tune across the yard that seemed as if it never had left off alas it was a tune that never does leave off was beating softly all the while wouldn't you like to step in said mr omer and speak to her walk in and speak to her sir make yourself at home i was too bashful to do so then i was afraid of confusing her and i was no less afraid of confusing myself but i informed myself of the hour at which she left of an evening in order that our visit might be timed accordingly and taking leave of mr omer and his pretty daughter and her little children went away to my dear old peggotty's here she was in the tiled kitchen cooking dinner the moment i knocked at the door she opened it and asked me what i pleased to want I looked at her with a smile, but she gave me no smile in return. I had never ceased to write to her, but it must have been seven years since we had met. "'Is Mr. Barkis at home, ma'am?' I said, feigning to speak roughly to her. "'He's at home, sir,' returned Peggotty. "'But he's bad at bed with the rheumatics.' "'Don't he go over to Blunderstone now?' I asked. "'When he's well he do,' she answered. "'Do you ever go there, Mrs. Barkis?' She looked at me more attentively, and I noticed a quick movement of her hands towards each other. "'Because I want to ask a question about a house there, that they call, what is it, the rookery,' said I. She took a step backward, and put out her hands in an undecided, frightened way, as if to keep me off. "'Peggotty!' I cried to her. 
she cried my darling boy and we both burst into tears and were locked in one another's arms what extravagances she committed what laughing and crying over me what pride she showed what joy what sorrow that she whose pride and joy i might have been could never hold me in a fond embrace i have not the heart to tell i was troubled with no misgiving that it was young in me to respond to her emotions that i never laughed and cried in all my life i dare say not even to her more freely than i did that morning barkis will be so glad said peggotty wiping her eyes with her apron that it'll do him more good than pints of liniment may i go and tell him you are here will you come up and see him my dear of course i would but Peggotty would not get out of the room as easily as she meant to, for as often as she got to the door and looked round at me, she came back again to have another laugh and another cry upon my shoulder. At last, to make the matter easier, I went upstairs with her, and having waited outside for a minute, while she said a word of preparation to Mr. Barkis, presented myself before that invalid. He received me with absolute enthusiasm. He was too rheumatic to be shaken hands with, but he begged me to shake the tassels on the top of his nightcap, which I did most cordially. When I sat down by the side of the bed, he said to me that it did him the world of good to feel as if he was driving me on the Blunderstone Road again. As he lay in bed, face upward, and so covered with that exception that he seemed to be nothing but a face, like a conventional cherubim, he looked the queerest object I ever beheld. "'What name was it as I wrote up in the cart, sir?' said Barkis, with a slow, rheumatic smile. Ah, Mr. Barkis, we had some grave talks about that matter, hadn't we? I was willing a long time, sir, said Mr. Barkis. A long time, said I. And I don't regret it, said Mr. Barkis. Do you remember what you told me once, about her making all the apple parsties and doing all the cooking? Yes, very well, I returned. It was true, said Mr. Barkis, as turnips is. It was true said Mr. Barkis, nodding his nightcap, which was his only means of emphasis, as taxes is, and nothing's truer than them. Mr. Barkis turned his eyes upon me, as if for my assent to this result of his reflections in bed, and I gave it. "'Nothing's truer than them,' repeated Mr. Barkis. "'A man as poor as I am finds that out in his mind when he's laid up. I'm a very poor man, sir.' "'I am sorry to hear it, Mr. Barkis.' "'A very poor man, indeed I am,' said Mr. Barkis. Here his right hand came slowly and feebly from under the bedclothes, and with a purposeless, uncertain grasp took hold of a stick which was loosely tied to the side of the bed. After some poking about with this instrument, in the course of which his face assumed a variety of distracted expressions, Mr. Barkis poked it against a box, an end of which had been visible to me all the time. Then his face became composed old clothes said mr barkis oh said i i wish it was money sir said mr barkis i wished it was indeed said i but it ain't said mr barkis opening both his eyes as wide as he possibly could i expressed myself quite sure of that and mr barkis turning his eyes more gently to his wife said she's the usefulest and best of women c p barkis all the praise that any one can give to c p barkis she deserves and more my dear you'll get a dinner to-day for company something good to eat and drink will you i should have protested against this unnecessary demonstration in my honour but that i saw peggotty on the opposite side of the bed extremely anxious i should not so i held my peace i got a trifle of money somewhere about me my dear said mr barkis but i'm a little tired if you and mr david will leave me for a short nap i'll try and find it when i wake we left the room in compliance with this request when we got outside the door peggotty informed me that mr barkis being now a little nearer than he used to be always resorted to this same device before producing a single coin from his store and that he endured unheard-of agonies in crawling out of bed alone and taking it from that unlucky box in effect we presently heard him uttering suppressed groans of the most dismal nature as this magpie proceeding racked him in every joint but while peggotty's eyes were full of compassion for him she said his generous impulse would do him good and it was better not to check it so he groaned on until he had got into bed again suffering i have no doubt a martyrdom 
and then he called us in, pretending to have just woke up from a refreshing sleep, and to produce a guinea from under his pillow. His satisfaction, in which happy imposition on us, and in having preserved the impenetrable secret of the box, appeared to be a sufficient compensation to him for all his tortures. I prepared Peggotty for Steerforth's arrival, and it was not long before he came. I am persuaded she knew no difference between his having been a personal benefactor of hers and a kind friend to me, and that she would have received him with the utmost gratitude and devotion in any case. But his easy, spirited good humour, his genial manner, his handsome looks, his natural gift of adapting himself to whomsoever he pleased, and making direct when he cared to do it to the main point of interest in anybody's heart, bound her to him wholly in five minutes. His manner to me alone would have won her, but through all these causes combined I sincerely believe she had a kind of adoration for him before he left the house that night. He stayed there with me to dinner. If I were to say willingly, I should not half express how readily and gaily. He went to Mr. Barkis's room like light and air, brightening and refreshing it as if he were healthy weather. There was no noise, no effort, no consciousness in anything he did, but in everything an indescribable lightness, a seeming impossibility of doing anything else, or doing anything better, which was so graceful, so natural and agreeable, that it overcomes me even now in the remembrance. We made merry in the little parlour where the book of martyrs unthumbed since my time was laid out upon the desk as of old, and where I now turned over its terrific pictures, remembering the old sensations they had wakened, but not feeling them. When Peggotty spoke of what she called my room, and of its being ready for me at night, and of her hoping I would occupy it, before I could so much as look at Steerforth hesitating, he was possessed of the whole case. "'Of course,' he said, "'you'll sleep there while we stay, and I shall sleep at the hotel.' "'But to bring you so far,' I returned, "'and to separate seems bad companionship, Steerforth.' "'Why, in the name of heaven, where do you naturally belong?' he said. "'What it seems compared to that?' It was settled at once. He maintained all his delightful qualities to the last, until we started forth at eight o'clock for Mr. Peggotty's boat. Indeed, they were more and more brightly exhibited as the hours went on, for I thought even then, and I have no doubt now, that the consciousness of success in his determination to please inspired him with a new delicacy of perception, and made it, subtle as it was, more easy to him. If anyone had told me then that all this was a brilliant game played for the excitement of the moment, for the employment of high spirits, in the thoughtless love of superiority, in a mere wasteful, careless course of winning what was worthless to him, and next minute thrown away, I say, if anyone had told me such a lie that night, I wonder in what manner of receiving it my indignation would have found a vent, probably only in an increase, had that been possible, of the romantic feelings of fidelity and friendship with which I walked beside him over the dark wintry sands towards the old boat, the wind sighing round us even more mournfully than it had sighed and moaned upon the night when I first darkened Mr. Peggotty's door. "'This is a kind of wild place, Steerforth, is it not?' "'Dismal enough in the dark,' he said, "'and the sea roars as if it were hungry for us. "'Is that the boat, where I see the light yonder?' "'That's the boat,' said I. "'And it's the same I saw this morning,' he returned. "'I came straight to it, by instinct, I suppose.' "'We said no more as we approached the light, "'but made softly for the door. "'I laid my hand upon the latch, "'and whispering Steerforth to keep close to me, went in.' A murmur of voices had been audible on the outside, and, at the moment of our entrance, a clapping of hands, which latter noise I was surprised to see, proceeded from the generally disconsolate Mrs. Gummidge. But Mrs. Gummidge was not the only person there who was unusually excited. Mr. Peggotty, his face lighted up with uncommon satisfaction, and laughing with all his might, held his rough arms wide open, as if for little Emily to run into them. Ham, with a mixed expression in his face of admiration, exultation, and a lumbering sort of bashfulness that sat upon him very well, held little Emily by the hand, as if he were presenting her to Mr. Peggotty. Little Emily herself, blushing and shy, but delighted with Mr. Peggotty's delight, as her joyous eyes expressed, was stopped by our entrance, for she saw us first, in the very act of springing from Ham to nestle in Mr. Peggotty's embrace. In the first glimpse we had of them all, and at the moment of our passing from the dark, cold night into the warm, light room, this was the way in which they were all employed, Mrs. Gummidge in the background clapping her hands like a madwoman. 
The little picture was so instantaneously dissolved by our going in that one might have doubted whether it had ever been. I was in the midst of the astonished family, face to face with Mr. Peggotty, and holding out my hand to him when Ham shouted, "'Master Davy! It's Master Davy!' In a moment we were all shaking hands with one another and asking one another how we did and telling one another how glad we were to meet and all talking at once. Mr. Peggotty was so proud and overjoyed to see us that he did not know what to do or say, but kept over and over again shaking hands with me and then with Steerforth and then with me and then ruffling his shaggy hair all over his head and laughing with such glee and triumph that it was a treat to see him. Why that you two gentlemen, gentlemen Grove, should come to this here roof tonight of all nights of my life, said Mr. Peggotty, is such a thing as never happened afore, I do rightly believe. Little Emily, my darling, come here, come here, my little witch. There's Master Davy's friend, my dear. There's the gentleman as you've heard on, Emily. He comes to see you along with Master Davy on the brightest night of your uncle's life as ever was or ever will be. Come to the one and hurrah for it. After delivering this speech all in a breath, and with extraordinary animation and pleasure, Mr. Peggotty put one of his large hands rapturously on each side of his niece's face, and kissing it a dozen times, laid it with a gentle pride and love upon his broad chest, and patted it as if his hand had been a lady's. Then he let her go, and as she ran into the little chamber where I used to sleep, looked round upon us, quite hot and out of breath, with his uncommon satisfaction. "'If you two gentlemen—' "'Gentlemen growed now, and such gentlemen,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'So they are, so they are,' cried Ham. "'Well said, so they are. Master Davy bore, gentlemen growed, so they are.' "'If you two gentlemen, gentlemen growed,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'don't excuse me for being in a state of mind when you understand matters, I'll ask your pardon. Emily, my dear, she knows I'm going to tell,' here his delight broke out again, "'and has made off.' "'Would you be so good as to look after her, Martha, for a minute?' Mrs. Gummidge nodded and disappeared. "'If this ain't,' said Mr. Peggotty, sitting down among us by the fire, "'the brightest night of my life, I'm a shellfish, boiled too, and more I can't say. "'This here little Emily, sir,' in a low voice to Steerforth, "'her as you see a blushin' here just now.' Steerforth nodded, but with such a pleased expression of interest and of participation in Mr. Peggotty's feelings that the latter answered him as if he had spoken. "'To be sure,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'that's her, and so she is. Thank ye, sir.' Ham nodded to me several times, as if he would have said so too. "'This here little Emily of ours,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'has been in our house what I suppose, I'm an ignorant man, but that's my belief, no one but a little bright-eyed creature can be in a house. She ain't my child, never had one, but I couldn't love her more. You understand, I couldn't do it.' "'I quite understand,' said Steerforth. "'I know you do, sir,' returned Mr. Peggotty, "'and thank ye again. "'Master Davy, he can remember what she was. "'You may judge from your own self what she is, "'but neither of you can fully know what she has been, "'is and will be to my loving heart.' "'I'm rough, sir,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'I'm as rough as a sea porcupine, "'but no one, unless mayhap it is a woman, "'can know, I think, what our little Emily is to me. "'And betwixt ourselves?' sinking his voice lower yet. That woman's name ain't Mrs. Gummidge neither, though she has a world of merits. Mr. Peggotty ruffled his hair again with both hands, as a further preparation for what he was going to say, and went on, with a hand upon each of his knees. There was a certain person as has knowed our Emily from the time when her father was drowned, as has seen her constant when a babby, when a young girl, when a woman. Not much of a person to look at he wasn't, said Mr. Peggotty, something of my own build. Rough, a good deal of sou'wester in him, where he salt, but on the whole, a honest sort of a chap, with his heart in the right place. I thought I had never seen Ham grin to anything like the extent to which he sat grinning at us now. What does this ere blessed tarpaulin go and do? said Mr. Peggotty, with his face one high noon of enjoyment. But he loses that there heart of his to our little Emily. He follows her about, he makes hisself a sort of servant to her. He loses in a great measure his relish for his whittles, and in the long run he makes it clear to me what's amiss. Now I could wish myself, you see, that our little Emily was in a fair way of being married. I could wish to see her, in all events, under articles to a honest man as had right to defend her. I don't know how long I may live, or how soon I may die, but I know that if I was capsized any night in a gale of wind in Yarmouth Roads here, 
and was to see the town light shining for the last time over the rollers as I couldn't make no head against. I could go down quieter for thinking. There's a man ashore there. Iron true to my little Emily, God bless her, and no wrong can touch my Emily, while so be as that man lives. Mr. Peggotty, in simple earnestness, waved his right arm, as if he were waving at the town lights for the last time, and then, exchanging a nod with Ham, whose eye he caught, proceeded as before. "'Well, I counsels him to speak to Emily. He's big enough, but he's bashfuller than a little un, and he don't like, so I speak.' "'What, him?' says little Emily. "'Him that I've known so intimate so many years, and like so much. Oh, uncle, I never can have him. He's such a good fellow.' I gives her a kiss, and I says no more to her than, "'My dear, you are right to speak out. You're to choose for yourself. You're as free as a little bird.' Then I aways to him, and I says, I wish it could have been so, but it can't. But you can both be as you was, and what I say to you is, be as you was with her, like a man. He says to me, a shaking of my hand, I will, he says. And he was, honourable and manful for two year going on, and we was just the same at home here as afore. Mr. Peggotty's face, which had varied in its expression with the various stages of his narrative, now resumed all its former triumphant delight as he laid a hand upon my knee and a hand upon Steerforth's, previously wetting them both for the greater emphasis of the action, and divided the following speech between us. All of a sudden, one evening, as it might be to-night, comes little Emily from her work and him with her. There ain't so much in that, you'll say. No, because he takes care on her like a brother, after dark, and indeed afore dark, and at all times. But this tarpaulin chap, she takes hold of her hand, and he cries out to me, joyful, "'Look here, this is to be my little wife,' and she says, half bold and half shy, and half a laughing and half a crying, "'Yes, uncle, if you please.' "'If I please,' cried Mr. Peggotty, rolling his head in an ecstasy at the idea. "'Lord, as if I should do anything else. "'If you please, I am steadier now, and I have thought the better of it, "'and I'll be as good a little wife as I can to him, for he's a dear good fellow. "'Then Mrs. Gummidge, she claps her hands like a play, and you come in.' "'There, the murder's out,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'You come in. "'It took place this here present hour, "'and here's the man that'll marry her "'the minute she's out of her time.' Ham staggered, as well he might, "'under the blow Mr. Peggotty dealt him "'in his unbounded joy, "'as a mark of confidence and friendship. "'But feeling called upon to say something to us, "'he said with much faltering and great difficulty, "'She weren't no higher than you was, Master Davy, "'when you first come, "'when I thought what she'd growed up to be.' I seed her grown up gentleman like a flower. I'd lay down my life for a master, Davy. Oh, most content and cheerful. She's more to me, gentlemen, than she's all to me that I can want, and more than I ever, than I ever could say. I love her true. There ain't a gentleman in all the world, nor yet sailing upon all the sea, that can love his lady more than I love her. Though there's many a common man would say better what he meant. I thought it affecting to see such a sturdy fellow as Ham was, now trembling at the strength of what he felt for the pretty little creature who had won his heart. I thought the simple confidence reposed in us by Mr. Peggotty and by himself was in itself affecting. I was affected by the story altogether. How far my emotions were influenced by the recollections of my childhood I don't know. Whether I had come there with any lingering fancy that I was still to love little Emily, I don't know. I know that I was filled with pleasure by all this, but at first with an indescribably sensitive pleasure that a very little would have changed to pain. Therefore, if it had depended upon me to touch the prevailing chord among them with any skill, I should have made a poor hand of it. But it depended upon Steerforth, and he did it with such address that in a few minutes we were all as easy and as happy as it was possible to be. Mr. Peggotty, he said, you are a thoroughly good fellow, and deserve to be as happy as you are to-night. My hand upon it. Ham, I give you joy, my boy. My hand upon that, too. Daisy, stir the fire and make it a brisk one. And, Mr. Peggotty, unless you can induce your gentle niece to come back, for whom I vacate this seat in the corner, I shall go. Any gap at your fireside on such a night, such a gap, least of all, I wouldn't make for the wealth of the Indies. So Mr. Peggotty went into my old room to fetch little Emily. At first little Emily didn't like to come, and then Ham went. Presently they brought her to the fireside very much confused and very shy, but soon she became more assured when she found how gently and respectfully Steerforth spoke to her. 
how skilfully he avoided anything that would embarrass her how he talked to mr peggotty of boats and ships and tides and fish how he referred to me about the time when he had seen mr peggotty at salem house how delighted he was with the boat and all belonging to it how lightly and easily he carried on until he brought us by degrees into a charmed circle and we were all talking away without any reserve emily indeed said little all the evening but she looked and listened and her face got animated and she was charming steerforth told a story of a dismal shipwreck which arose out of his talk with mr peggotty as if he saw it all before him and little emily's eyes were fastened on him all the time as if she saw it too he told us a merry adventure of his own as a relief to that with as much gaiety as if the narrative was as fresh to him as it was to us and little emily laughed until the boat rang with the musical sounds and we all laughed steerforth too in irresistible sympathy with what was so pleasant and light-hearted we got mr peggotty to sing or rather roar when the stormy winds do blow do blow do blow and he sang a sailor song himself so pathetically and beautifully that i could have almost fancied that the real wind creeping sorrowfully round the house and murmuring low through our unbroken silence was there to listen as to mrs gummidge he roused that victim of despondency with a success never attained by any one else so mr peggotty informed me since the decease of the old one he left her so little leisure for being miserable that she said next day she thought she must have been bewitched but he set up no monopoly of the general attention or the conversation when little emily grew more courageous and talked but still bashfully across the fire to me of her old wanderings upon the beach to pick up shells and pebbles and when i asked her if she recollected how i used to be devoted to her and when we both laughed and reddened casting these looks back on the pleasant old times so unreal to look at now he was silent and attentive, and observed us thoughtfully. She sat at this time and all the evening on the old locker in her old little corner by the fire. Ham sat beside her where I used to sit. I could not satisfy myself whether it was in her own little tormenting way, or in a maidenly reserve before us, that she kept quite close to the wall and away from him, but I observed that she did so all the evening. As I remember, it was almost midnight when we took our leave. We had had some biscuits and dried fish for supper, and Steerforth had produced from his pocket a full flask of Hollands, which we men, I may say we men now without a blush, had emptied. We parted merrily, and as they all stood crowded round the door to light us as far as they could upon our road, I saw the sweet blue eyes of little Emily peeping after us from behind Ham, and heard her soft voice calling to us to be careful how we went. "'A most engaging little beauty,' said Steerforth, taking my arm. "'Well, it's a quaint place, and they're quaint company, and it's quite a new sensation to mix with them.' "'How fortunate we are, too,' I returned, "'to have arrived to witness their happiness in that intended marriage. "'I never saw people so happy. "'How delightful to see it, and to be made the sharers in their honest joy, as we have been.' "'That's rather a chuckle-headed fellow for the girl, isn't he?' said Steerforth. He had been so hearty with him, and with them all, that I felt a shock in this unexpected and cold reply. But turning quickly upon him, and seeing a laugh in his eyes, I answered, much relieved, "'Ah, Steerforth, it's well for you to joke about the poor. You may skirmish with Miss Dartle, or try to hide your sympathies in jests from me, but I know better. I see how perfectly you understand them, how exquisitely you can enter into happiness like this plain fisherman's, or humour a love like my old nurse's. I know that there's not a joy or sorrow, not an emotion of such people, that can be indifferent to you. And I admire and love you for it, Steerforth, twenty times more." He stopped, and, looking at my face, said, "'Daisy, I believe you are in earnest, and are good. I wish we all were.' Next moment he was gaily singing Mr. Peggotty's song, as we walked at a round pace back to Yarmouth.